Gracias. Ha bu arada söylemiş miydim? Altını çok severiz. E yakışır da. Bir kenarda sessiz sakin kendi halimizde otururuz. Öyle herkesin içinde kaka falan da atmayız. Lütfen yapar mıyız hiç? <gülüyor> Siz bizi bilirsiniz. Değil mi? A very good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on a Saturday afternoon. As thank you. A few logistic announcements before we begin. Uh, this is uh, I can't insist on this. Uh, enough, please do not use your phones or click pictures. Uh, the phone will be taken away and you will get it probably after three days. If you don't want to be reached out to, then it's okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, just, I mean, we will be capturing moments. As you can see, the videographer is here and we have a great photographer here. We will be capturing the moments and sharing them with you later. Uh, so please be rest assured that you will get the moments clicked. Uh, don't use your phones. And uh, please uh, take away your tags and keep them inside the bag. Uh, it can't be photographed. Uh, the strict pro protocols. So I thought I'll get that boring part out of the way before we get started. Uh, if I can request all of you to assemble here, we will be starting off with a group picture. And please remember where your seats are to get back. Was that exercise enough after lunch? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a great joy and privilege to warmly welcome all of you to the inauguration of our Women on Boards initiative. This flagship program, now in its second edition, very proudly so, and the success of this event today is attributed to the tremendous support we have garnered from the consulate, AWE Foundation, and our community of women leaders. Today's launch is not just about creating opportunities. It's a significant milestone in our commitment to fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion in leadership roles and getting women board ready. This initiative has been born out of recognition that diversity is not only a matter of ethical responsibility, but a catalyst for innovation, resilience, and sustainable growth. In advocating for increased female representation on boards, we are not only endorsing a more inclusive future, but also tapping into the abundance of talent and viewpoints that have, for an extended period, been inadequately represented. Thanks to each one of you who has committed a Saturday afternoon to this cause and to be part of the signif significant moment with us today. Today's lineup of speakers include eminent personalities from the US Consulate, from CII, 
from across industries. And I cannot imagine the voice for diversity and inclusion getting louder than this. To run a successful program, we definitely need great partnerships. And we have one such one with Seema Chaturvedi, who was kind enough to record a video. She couldn't be here in person. Uh, so Abhijit, if you could bring up the video. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of a deeply impactful program, Women on Boards Cohort Number Two. A very warm welcome to Council General Michael Hankey, and a very warm welcome to Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Horst. My name is Seema Chaturvedi. I'm founder chairperson of AWE Foundation, a US-based nonprofit with a simple but powerful mission of making women economically independent to drive gender equitable growth. Unfortunately, I'm not there in person to welcome each one of you, but I know that our mission resonates loudly amongst every one of you. We are delighted to have the support of a very strong implementation partner on the ground, Aspire for Her, capably led by Madhura and Bhavna in launching this impactful program. A deep gratitude also for the passionate leaders within the Mumbai Consulate, Amrita DeMello, Tejas, and many other leaders that were, have worked with us tirelessly in making this program a success. As you will hear from the leaders and the dignitaries in the ensuing minutes, this program has the potency of dramatically changing the growth trajectory of gender equality in India and globally. We are excited for the launch and I look forward to meeting each one of you in person soon. Thank you Seema for that great partnership. I'd like to now call upon Madhura Das Gupta Sinha, uh, founder and CEO of Aspire for Her, to take us through the impact that's been created so far. Thank you so much. It almost seems unreal to stand here, almost exactly after one year since our wonderful journey began. I am Madhura Das Gupta Sinha, founder and CEO of Aspire for Her. At Aspire for Her, we are adding a million women to the workforce by 2025. Let me start with the journey that started just about a year ago. When the US consulate talked to us about setting up a women on boards cohort, we just didn't want to do that. We wanted to have a community of women leaders who cheer for each other, who motivate each other, who elevate each other. And today, I'm so happy to see that many of our leaders from the first cohort have taken the time out of their busy schedules, have flown into Mumbai just to be part of this event. You know who you are, so thank you very much for making the effort to our wonderful mentors. So what were we trying to do if you we are not just trying to get women into boardrooms? We were trying to build a village. A village which supports each other, a community which collaborates with each other, and who ensure that they open rooms, open doors for women in rooms that they had never been into. And let me share a little bit about what's been happening to the first cohort. You saw some numbers and some statistics. And there were a bunch of people who graduated in this very room, uh, just uh, seems like a few months ago. Well, two of them, Jaya Janardhanan and Jamuna Ravi, went on to quickly getting onto board positions. Can I have a round of applause for them? Many of them got themselves certified through IICA and became certified board members. 
and are waiting to get into board positions. Many of them got awards, distinctions, achievements, and we cheered for them as we saw them authoring books, we saw them getting awarded, uh, we saw them getting uh, distinct, distinctive uh, 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 you know, awards in various, various walks of life. Purnima Shinoy, one of our mentors at Aspire for Her, who was very closely associated with the program, went on to take on a leadership position at FIKI, and today she is partnering for Indo-US trade partnership from Washington, DC. We had two leaders who came forward and started doing something amazing at Aspire for Her, like all our mentors do. We had Radha Ramadurai, who came forward to build our women in banking community at Aspire for Her. <laughs> Radha is right here in this room. Thank you. We had Simran Jindal, who had actually traveled all the way from Sweden for her uh, last cohort uh, graduation, started something called She Knows Money. And this is all about financial literacy at Aspire for Her. Simran is also a part of IBM. And today we're very thrilled to have our partners IBM represented by none other than Mr. Sandeep Patel, who is in this room. But this was not all. I think what we truly created was a bond of friendship, of camaraderie, and something much deeper than just a mere networking relationship. I think that is what the first cohort created. And they're, in fact, very jealous of the fact that they're now not going to be the only cohort of women on boards that aspire for her. They are going to be now the alumnus. And this is my pride and privilege to actually announce the Women on Board's second edition right here in front of you. <laughs> we did a soft launch of this program on November 3rd. And today we are celebrating, of course, physically, because we wanted all of you to see what a wonderful place those tea house is. And of course, with the amazing partners, US Consulate and our foundation. The next important date to keep in mind, and these are all very tactical announcements now, um, is December 11th, which is the last day of putting in our application, if you do want to be part of the program. December 20th is another important date, because that's when the announcements will be made. I know some of you will ask us, who is going to evaluate the uh, applications, and how is the cohort going to be selected? So let me do that. It's going to be evaluated by a set of independent jury, some of whom are sitting over here, but I shall not tell you who they are. And uh, we are going to be evaluating them for diversity. We are going to be evaluating them for performance, you know, and all of their journeys that they have been on. But we are going to be evaluating them with a bias. And that bias will be for women who open doors for other women. Because that's the kind of person that we want in our Women on Board second edition. Nothing changes from our tenets that we had laid down for the first one. So the cohort is going to start on 12th of January. And uh, we are going to end in March 2024. We don't have an exact date as yet, but we will get back to you very soon on the exact date. And uh, there's a little bit of a difference between the first cohort and the second edition. And let me just take a few seconds to tell you about that. Well, uh, the first cohort, as all of you know, had Friday evening sessions almost every Friday, and they were online. And uh, you know, we had the inauguration and the graduation ceremony here in Dosti House itself. Well, the good news is that the second edition will have 
far more in-person interactions. The Friday sessions will all be online, nothing changes in that. But we have added two more in-person interactions, one a month here in this wonderful premises of Dosti House. And you will be able to enjoy uh, the company of Mike Hankey, uh, Brenda Soya, uh, their wonderful teams, and uh, you, know, you will be able to spend some time with them. And we have some very exciting plans in place, so um, we'll get back to you on that soon. Uh, so that's, that's one. And the second difference will be that we are introducing uh, a whole track of electives this time. Depending on the composition of the cohort, uh, we have in mind to introduce electives which the cohort will appreciate more uh, so that they can walk into boardrooms with more confidence. One of the electives that we've been thinking around is finance for non-finance uh, executives. And today we have so many doyens of the financial world sitting here, uh, but I do know that many women are sometimes a little overwhelmed by a lot of numbers being thrown at them. So this is one of the tracks that we have in mind, but we do want to have this whole concept of electives which you want to uh, put in here. And the last difference will be that this will be a more immersive experience uh, because uh, last time, as some of you remember, we had a very cool uh, drama kind of an interaction where all the cohort members actually put up dramas uh, and the best people got to perform over here. Uh, but this time we want to actually give a little more immersive experience in the impact world uh, so that if any of you are thinking of uh, uh, sort of delving into the world of impact uh, and into the world of NGOs, nonprofits, then we will give you some live experiences in working with them so that you can come and present your impact here. And, uh, you know, as always, the best people will actually get, the best group will get a chance to speak here and talk to us at the grand finale here. So that's a little bit about uh, uh, this cohort. And any questions, we are all here. Uh, the Aspire for her team is right here. Uh, and I also wanted to mention you know, one of the impacts of the last cohort. And this isn't typical Aspire for her style. We like to encourage paying it forward. So uh, Bhuvna, who is actually, uh, there she is. Bhuvna, who is actually a graduate of the last cohort, has taken on the mantle of leading this cohort. Thank you, Bhuvna, for that. And not to mention, Bhuvna has also written a book. And uh, some of you, let me keep that a secret, but some of you will get a chance to get a signed copy of the book from Bhuvna. <laughs> Going forward, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the help that we've got in this journey and some of the milestones of this journey um, in the last 12 months. Uh, the Women on Boards cohort has actually just been one part of the wonderful work that we've done with the U.S. Consulate. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say thank you to my friends here at the U.S. Consulate because they have become like family. And you don't say thank you to family. So I'm not going to do that. But I think the way in which we've had uh, Mike, Brenda, Rob, Amrita, uh, Richa, uh, and so many of them support us absolutely beautifully. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. So thank you so much for that. In, in, in addition to what we were doing with Women on Boards, Brenda took time out on another Saturday afternoon to speak with us about She Knows Money. Her amazing journey is very, very inspiring. And on October 31st, when we were doing a flagship event with Amazon Web Services, um, you know, our very, very favorite partners, uh, Gloria Barbena took time out from her busy schedule to actually come in and address uh, you know, our audience uh, in, in Delhi, in Gurgaon. And uh, it was wonderful because I think for the first and last time in my life, uh, I heard in the same sentence, uh, Aspire for Her and Madhura, along with what was happening in the bigger, broader world, uh, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So <laughs> I thought that was the high point uh, you know, of uh, Gloria's address, but uh, which is otherwise also very, very motivating, and our audience loved it. 
so that's a little bit about uh, uh, the work that we do with uh, the US consulate. Um, and I just wanted to also say thank you to our foundation, Asima Chaturvedi, who's been the wind beneath our wings. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to thank all the members, mentors that aspire for her, and a lot of the members of the Women on Board's first cohort have gone on to now become mentors at Aspire for Her. Uh, so that's how we roll. Uh, that's how the community actually builds. And that's how the community keeps elevating each other. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for traveling uh, from so many of you have traveled down to be here. Thank you so much for doing that. And of course, uh, the wonderful Aspire for Her team, uh, you know, Bhuvna, Ruchita, Hiral, uh, our entire team has put in a lot of effort to lovingly create and curate this program. So, um, and it's, it's always been wonderful to get the advice and the support of Divya Sampath, Jaya Janardhanan, who are right here in this room. So thank you so much. Well, you know, we are looking for a boardroom in India, which will look very different, which will look at some point in time when we will transcend beyond just the regulatory norms of having one woman independent director and want to do bigger things in life and voices will be heard. That's the day that we are dreaming about. And without all your support, we would not be able to do that. So Elizabeth, a warm welcome to Aspire for Her. And we couldn't think of anyone better uh, with uh, the kind of experience and the kind of background that you have. Our team is absolutely motivated, inspired to meet you, excited to meet you and ask you questions. Thank you for that. And you know, there's an Instagram meme which is going around. And uh, you know, I am desperately trying to, because a lot of our community members are very young, I'm desperately trying to get myself acquainted with what uh, Instagram is, uh, is sort of dictating. And you know, I couldn't think of a better line than for us to cheer that board of the future, which is inclusive, which is equal, and which is full of women. And I'm going to say the first two lines, and I'm hoping that all of you have been also keeping track of the Instagram trends, and you will say the third line for me. Should I get going? Are you all ready? Yes. I'm looking at the board, which is equal, inclusive. And I'm going to say this, so beautiful, <laughs> so elegant, Thank you. <laughs> so those of, for those of you who didn't get it, I can repeat it once again. This, this woman, her name is Jasmeet Kaur. She has had only 100 million downloads of this. Okay. And she has become an instant celebrity in true Instagram style. So I'll do it once again. So beautiful. So elegant. Just looking like a wow. And that's what the board of the future will look like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhura. I mean, that was like a, 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 it should have been a grand finale, but yes, we'll take that now. Um, now I'd like to, you know, uh, welcome uh, someone who's made this real change happen. Uh, real change happens when allies uh, challenge the status quo, dismantle stereotypes, and actively support the empowerment of all. We have one person who has led us from the front, and it's none other than Mike Hankey, Consul General, U.S. Consulate, Mumbai. He is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service and currently serves as Consul General at the U.S. Consulate General, Mumbai. He has extensive experience in diplomacy, having previously held positions in Amman, Jerusalem, and Saudi Arabia. Hanke has led 
teams to build strong relationships with political, economic and media partners across the Middle East, Africa and South Asia. He speaks Arabic, French and Tamil. I was very excited to know he speaks Tamil and I wanted to speak to him in that language. <laughs> we'll catch up later, Mike. And uh, holds a bachelor's degree in international affairs and journalism from George Washington University and a master's degree in second language education from Indiana University. Hankney, Hanky is accompanied by his wife and two sons in Mumbai. It's my absolute pleasure to bring you on here, Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. I know we're excited to get to hear from the panelists here. So I want to first thank Madhura not only for putting this together, but also for already sharing with you so many of the things that I wanted to also celebrate today. Because one year ago when we did the first launch and then we went through the graduation, it was, uh, we weren't sure. Where is this going to go? And the proof, the data has shown exactly what Madhura said. And it's everybody from Jaya and Jamuna and Purnima, um, the work that they've done, Simran and Smita and the great connections. And I firmly do believe that the rest of that cohort is going to continue to make these connections and um, show the value of this program. So Madhura, uh, at a distance, Seema Chaturvedi, thanks to you, thanks to your teams, and congratulations for getting into this second round. The one point that I want to make is why does the U.S. consulate, why does the U.S. mission, why does the U.S. government get into this? And it's for two reasons. One, it's the morally right thing to do. We live in a diverse world. We live in a world that includes men and women, people of different faith backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, caste, religion, race. The right thing to do is to make a world that includes everyone, that has a space for voice and for economic growth for everyone. That's the morally right reason. The second is it makes good economic sense. And India is growing. It's doing nothing but growing. It's going to be among the top three economies in the world probably within a decade. It's already the biggest in terms of population. It's on the global stage. We saw that with the G20. I won't mention the World Cup for cricket, but OK. <laughs> so India is competing on the world stage. It's playing at the world stage. And to do that successfully, it's going to need every single member of its society to be fully engaged. When I talk to American companies, they're doing some of the very best work out here. They're multinationals. They are driven by one thing, which is profit. And they tell me the data show that an integrated leadership uh, cohort, an integrated staff, an integrated approach to the way they deal with their communities and their customers makes more money. So if you're not convinced by the morally right thing to do, look at the profit-based reason. And I would say, let's hope that the two come together. And mother, mother, that's what you and the rest of Aspire for Her and AWE do, and I appreciate that very much. Where we come in is to say, in this blossoming bilateral relationship between the United States and India, we've got a wonderful set of leaders in Prime Minister Modi and President Biden who have a warm personal connection that can facilitate so many things. I often like to refer to the fact that we have two countries with constitutions that share the same first three words, we the people. It's how our constitution starts in the United States and it's the way the Indian constitution starts. And from that basis, we have two populations that have shared values and shared goals. Do we have different ways of looking at the world and getting there? Yeah, we do. But ultimately, we want to see a world that's peaceful, prosperous, open, and secure. And to get there, we can build on that relationship that Biden and Modi have started. In Western India, particularly, I'm especially proud that we have partners on the NGO side, but also on the corporate side. And we're going to hear from some of them today. American companies that are doing the very best work in the world, and I think are real pace setters in terms of inclusion and profitability. We have partners on the Indian multinational corporate side that are doing the same. We have partners in the Indian chambers that are doing the same. And when we think about a country of 1.4 billion people, there's really no way that we could make a substantive difference if we restricted ourselves to just what we do within the four walls of this Dosti house. I don't even think that there's much of a difference that could be made if we had individual separate 
work among all these great multinationals and NGOs. But our power is going to come, and as Maduro was saying to me before, because my math isn't as good as hers, I said it's going to be when we add 1 plus 1 to make 3, and she said, no, 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 it's going to be when we add 1 plus 1 to make 11. And that's where we can get to. Our power is going to come from making coalitions and harnessing the thoughts, the input, looking at the challenges, but also seeing our successes among all of us in this room and like-minded uh, folks beyond. So that's my request. That's my ambition. That's what drives us within the consulate here in Western India. How do we pull those like-minded partners together? What you're embarking on today in the second cohort is very much part of that. And we look forward to not only facilitating that along the way, but then picking up graduates as they come out, expanding our circle, making connections as we are right here to expand the brain trust and achieve better women's economic empowerment, which will be better for all of us. Thank you. Mike, we'll just need you back here for just a second. We need uh, Shamla ma'am to be here. To Do I get a book? <laughs> I will give that to you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you, ma'am. Do we know where this one's from? This is from Odisha. Uh, Odisha? Yes. Is it? This is actually made from, from Jharkhand. Made from Jharkhand. Uh, so this yes. is made by an entrepreneur's mic. Wow. It's all handmade. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. The mic, so he wants to. Sorry. Check it back up. We can do this video. <laughs> Take 30 seconds, uh, you know, all of us only buy products made by entrepreneurs, and um, I think uh, what we've given Mike here uh, is a scarf made by the entrepreneurs of Jharkhand, uh, some of the poorest sections, uh, and they actually hand make this Kantha work, so Mike, we hope you'll wear this. Beautiful. And the <laughs> other piece that we've given Mike, and uh, we have hampers for all the other speakers as well, is made by a young entrepreneur right here, we'd love her to stand up. Uh, Divya, please stand up. <laughs> and talk to you too. So, this is a very dynamic art and niece duo. And Divya has, uh, is a very young entrepreneur. He puts together uh, beautiful collaterals and baggage tags and gift tags and things for the desk. So, Mike, and for all of you, that's going to be there. Thank you so much, Divya, Prachi. And Prachi is putting together. <laughs> Your name is there. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for that. And we definitely need more of those space sitters across the globe. Right. Uh, the next one is even more interesting, uh, the next section of our uh, program today. And uh, I really struggled to put this bio together because it was it went across the globe, and I didn't know which part to choose. And when you have role models like these, you don't need to look far. An absolute pleasure to have with us Elizabeth Horst, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary responsible for Pakistan. And uh, she's a member of Senior Foreign Service and has worked across many countries and continents. That's how I summarized it. <laughs> she served as a Peace Corps uh, volunteer in West Africa, and she speaks German, Russian, French, and Hausa. A proud native of Minnesota, she is married to Jason P. Gresh. To have a chat with her, we have our own Ruchita Tandon, Chief Growth Officer, Aspire for her. Over to you, Ruchita and Elizabeth, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's it going Saturday afternoon? Oh, I still don't hear full voices. Okay, nevertheless, we have a very interesting personality, and I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Host to aspire for her, India, and of course, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be doing the fireside chat with you. It's a delight to be here, and it's so exciting to see so many um, talented and enthusiastic faces here. This is a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Thank you so much. You've had an amazing, uh, I would say, journey. 20 countries, four continents. 
any story that actually left a deep impact on you when it comes to a leadership story? So, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, when, I, when I think of leadership, when I started the Foreign Service more than 20 years ago, I was amazed that as a junior officer, senior officers, ambassadors, senior women were so excited about me starting on my journey. And I think that is sometimes a rare thing, that you have senior people who are enthusiastic and happy for this next generation to come. I didn't feel like, oh, who's this young upstart? I had, in my first orientation class, some women found out where my next posting was going to be. I was going to our consulate in Lahore, and they said, I served in Lahore 20 years ago. You're going to come have lunch. And so these two women, I didn't know who they were, came and took me to lunch and said, here's what you need to know, here's what you need to do, we're so excited for you. And then later I found out these were two very senior ranking diplomats who had taken the time and they cared. Um, and I think that kind of enthusiasm is really important. Um, Madhura said something about women needed to open the doors for other women. I've always used the phrase, when you're climbing up, throw the ladder behind you. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and that, that sense of people above me cared and I can, I can pay it forward, I can do the same, made me feel welcome. There is plenty of room at the table. We're not needing to elbow each other out. We just pull up a chair and we get a little tighter, like any good family gathering, right? You can always find one more plate and one more room. So that's my leadership story when I started in the Foreign Service. That's amazing. We have partnered with the US consulate, so we had women on board one, which was amazing, good impact. Women on board two, yes, we are having the second one. Okay, what are the other successful initiatives that have helped gender diversity in the workplace that you've come across? You know, um, I love the fact that this, this says representation matters, especially in boardrooms, because I use the phrase representation matters all the time, and I want to, I'll get to the answer to your question, but I want to say why representation matters, because I think right now we kind of say, oh, it's important to have diversity in women. But it's not just even what Mike had talked about, about being economic. There are such profound impacts when you don't have representation. And I think about when they were introducing airbags into cars, and maybe some of you know this story. So they brought airbags into cars and engineers, this great safety uh, instruction, and then they found out airbags were killing women under five feet. Because there had been no women engineers as part of that team, and no one thought, I'm not a man who's 5'10 or higher, so there was a, 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 an impact because there was not diversity on that team. And so that's why representation matters also for safety and health reasons. Um, so your question was, what other things have we done or what helps bring diversity? I think you have to keep it in the forefront at all times and you have to not expect, all right, I'm gonna do one thing and then we're gonna be diverse and we're done and we can get onto other things. This is a little like, I say, it's like brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth today? You have to brush your teeth tomorrow, and you have to brush your teeth the next day. And so I think being really consistent and integrating the kinds of things that we talk about into all of our programming. So it's not just about getting women on boards, but it's also looking at, well, who are our applicants for programs and making sure that diversity is, um, who are people on panels? And when you have a panel of four people, are they, do they all look the same or are they different? And so rather than any one particular program or initiative, I think it is this principles that you have to apply to everything that we're doing on a daily basis over and over again until it becomes routine, like brushing your teeth. Thank you. And there is a little bit about Aspire for Her also that I'll have to share because we talk about a mindset change model. And we have seen that whether it's young girls in college or even senior women leaders probably did not realize uh, how is the diversity around them? And it is only because when they've come in, they've realized it, and we see exactly what you mentioned about, where they are looking at other women, they understand their role, their position, moving forward, giving back, and giving way to the others. And even for the women on both one cohort, we've seen that very, very well. So thank you for highlighting that. My last question, because uh, you know we are uh, we have a lot of agenda that's still An about to happen. Ambitious agenda today, yes. <laughs> it is, it is, and we have some real good speakers in the room, which we always have. 
And thanks to the US consulate, we have uh, Mike, Brenda, we have Amrita for always supporting us. So huge round of applause to the US consulate also. Thank you. What would you recommend leaders uh, need to bring in so that you know the cross-cultural practices work in continuing diversity and bringing up diversity? I find, as a leader, the more senior I get, the things that got me to that level are necessary, the things that I need to get to the next level. And one of those things is this, the higher you are, the more you need to listen. And you need to bring empathy. Um, and it's a little bit um, counterintuitive because you think, okay, we want our leaders to lead, be decisive, say things, do all of this, have a clear vision. And that is also important. But to carve out time where you are listening to understand other experiences, this is particularly important um, when we have generational change in the workplace. And I heard a, a great phrase once that said, you know, we talk a lot about mentoring, have mentors above you. Somebody said, no, you need some junior mentors. And I think, oh, that is so true. Like, and I find younger people in my workplace who I'll say, tell me what the latest thing is. What do I'm not understanding for a younger generation? So having that empathy and being ready to listen at all levels to think, and I think all of you know this, when you're a leader, the higher you get, the more you realize you do not have all the answers and you need to figure out who else does have them. I think that is absolutely critical. That was amazing, that was amazing. Thank you. And of course, you have an audience with so many women here today. Some of them women leaders, some of them applicants to our women on board too. And of course, what you see in the room are allies. Definitely, you have to count them, there are allies. So any words for the audience today? Absolutely. So I'm pleased to see men here. Because guys, we love you, we can't do it without you. This is not either or, yeah, a round of applause for the men. Yeah, that's a good one, Chandra. So, so, so truly, and, and it's great to have, you know, we have a male consul general who is so committed to this. This is not about men versus women. This is about men and women, again, using diversity of opinion and generations to make things better. When I, so, so number one, men, we need your help. You have wives and daughters and mothers and neighbors, and you can also throw the rope down to them to bring them up. And so my last thought is, remember to keep asking the question, where are the women? When I look at an organization now, even if it's something as simple as I'm looking to buy something online or I find a new organization, I immediately go and see who's on the board. And if I see a board that I think doesn't reflect what I want, I'll, I'll write and I'll say, so where are the women? And I want to encourage all of you to be asking, where are the women? It's a scary question to ask at first, because it sounds like, you know, oh, you're getting all woke. or This has become a bad thing in the United States. But it shouldn't be. We should be willing to ask that question. But don't be afraid to say, where is the diversity on your board? And then offer a solution. Hey, your board doesn't look very diverse. I've got three people I think that would really help. So not just criticize, but offer the alternative. And that is what is so fabulous about Women on Board Cohort too. You are the solution to that lack of diversity. And so do not be afraid, own that, and everyone in this room, ask the question, where are the women, and make sure you have some ideas of who can be on there. I can't wait to come back a year from now and see what cohort point, uh, 3.0 looks like. Two point. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just going to leave the room by saying one thing. When I read about Elizabeth, the 20 countries, I have to name a few, and these are the countries like Afghanistan, Tazakistan, Moscow, and Pakistan. And these are the countries, the moment I read about them, I said, oh, these are the countries we see on the first page of the newspaper, but you are really fearless. That's one thing that I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Praveena.
throw the rough towel. <laughs> A shout out to Praveena for just two seconds. Uh, Praveena and her wonderful team at NPCI is partnering with us to launch our latest community, our 18th community, Women in FinTech. So thank you, Praveena, Lalita. <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway for us is to ask the question, where are the women? And I'm sure it's going to be asked by everybody in this room once we leave here. Thank you for that uh, pearl of wisdom, Elizabeth. Thank you, Ruchita. And uh, I think you also brought upon the point of allies and men, yes. It is said that men who actively support and uplift women are not just allies, they are architects of a more inclusive and equitable future. With us, we have two such architects, Sandeep Patel, Managing Director, IBM Private Limited, and Chandra Balani, Head Global Enterprises at AWS India, who have not just been vocal about DEI, have not just been woke about it either, but have taken consistently on ground uh, to ensure that actions speak louder than words. Sandeep Patel is the MD for IBM India South Asia region. He is responsible for all IBM sale, sales, marketing, services, and delivery operations in the region. IBM has been at the forefront of DNI initiatives, and I have been a beneficiary of that as an ex-IBMer uh, for many decades. And Sandeep has been leading that from the forefront within and outside IBM. I invite you on stage, Sandeep. Chandra Balani is. Head Global Enterprises, India at Amazon Web Services, India Private Limited, the whistler in the room, Global Enterprises, <laughs> include global accounts with huge India presence in various verticals like financial services, manufacturing, automotive, life sciences, media, high tech, and others. He leads inclusion, diversity, and equity initiatives for AWS in India. He is also a certified EQ evangelist and helps Amazon and customers lead on epic leadership, leading with empathy, purpose, inspiration, and connection. To bring out their thoughts, we have with us powerhouse of a woman, Manisha Girotra, <laughs> CEO of Moili India. Manisha Girotra is an Indian uh, business executive, technology services for Mindtree had appointed Manisha, the India CEO of a leading global independent investment bank, to its board of directors. She's a graduate of the Delhi School of Economics. She's the country head of India for Moilies and Company today. Thank you, Manisha, for taking on this. Good afternoon, everyone. Is that, is that good? Can you hear me? I can't just tell you how excited I am to see all of you here. I hunt women out, so seeing all of you here is just like the most exciting thing. And I think Madhura, the beautiful, awesome, wow world is going to be where Usha and Shamala are going to say, let's have quotas for men. These women, you're training so many. <laughs> Correct, exactly. <laughs> Can we have some quota in men? <laughs> for men and women on boards, 3.0, <laughs> the next one. <laughs> So I'm going to take one second to just uh, digress, and that's not to take away from Sandeep and Chandra, who I'm sure are great allies, but my favorite ally is the Consul General Mike, and let me tell you why. Six months ago, I met his wife at a lunch, and she was wearing a beautiful sari, and I asked her who draped it for her, and she said, Mike. And, <laughs> and he knows perfectly how to do it. And I cannot begin to tell you how much in the doghouse my husband is since then. He's like, I'm like, you need to learn how to fold a sari. Let's start here. So, <laughs> so Mike, if you ever see Sanjay, you're not very popular with him. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you both for being there. And you know, for the last many decades, we've been talking about how women are held back in India by the patriarchy at home. Girls are just don't have access to enough education, jobs, their aspirations are crushed by early marriages, and it's really because of the patriarchal mindset at home. Uh, and you know, uh, that, that's something that I believe, and I, I think some of you will also agree with me, is changing. Maybe not rapidly enough, but is changing. More fathers, brothers, husbands are wanting to be sponsors of, their, of the girls and women in their family to go out there and really meet their aspirations. But still, 
uh, women in workforce, especially in urban India, is just 6%. And why is that? I think it's, it's a glaring low. 6% is probably the lowest in Asia. Forget the rest of the world. And, it, and when I speak to a lot of women who quit the workforce, it's, a lot of them say they just do not feel included enough. They don't feel part of the mainstream. They feel like an outsider, even though they've worked in organizations for 10, 15 years. You know, the water cooler conversations are just among the men about the cricket match that we lost last uh, last month, or you know, the pub conversations is about let's go catch a football uh, match, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I th wh why is that happening? Despite the fact that you know boards are trying to make the change, regulators are trying to make the change. And it boils down to the fact that these policies, etc., are not being implemented and not being owned by enough men. There aren't enough allies as men who are really wanting to amplify the voice of the minority, help them, and you know, make sure the policies are implemented. So I feel the to topic that Madhura chose today is really important for all of you as you go on to boards, which is that get the men to sponsor the women you know and, and this is this is i think as was said earlier uh, i think elizabeth said it we need both the men and the women right so use the men guys you know they're not very smart use them to your cause so <laughs> get on with it and and get them to sponsor it they'll be very excited tell them you're the sponsor and they'll do it <laughs> just whistle for us that's good enough <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, I just wanted to start with you, Chandra. I know you do a lot and you're really passionate about this cause. Um, but could you talk a little bit to us about how you see DEI changing? How do you see the changes in your organization? How do you see, do you, do you think that what I just said about the role of the ally being critical for the woman to get into the next level of evolution in the workforce is, is actually materializing? Um, so, yeah, I, I do see the change. Uh, it, it could be faster. Uh, but, um, you know, I... I I started my journey, uh, you know, about three years ago, uh, where um, you know our talent acquisition team came back saying that um, they are not getting enough referrals um, from within uh, to get more diversity candidates. They are not getting enough women as part of the referral campaign, even though they doubled the bonus for for reference. And um, uh, that problem was brought to our leadership team, and um, I raised my hand. Uh, I was part of uh, production engineering, you know, similar to mechanical, where you'd have three girls in 30. <laughs> I didn't want a workplace like that, <laughs> right? So I raised my hand, and um, ever since I've been part of that campaign, and um, you know, you know uh, we started with uh, a gamified version of uh, referral uh, campaigns, and uh, we worked on it for three months. Uh, at the end of it, um, we got 407 referrals from from the previous seven uh, and then uh, we got 87 hires out of that in a period of three years uh, we've we've increased um, our diversity for women by a thousand points uh, in 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 AWS India uh, and um, you know it, it just it's just not enough um, we feel hiring I mean hiring to a sense is also selfish. I mean, we're doing the right thing, but we're not doing the right thing for the entire community. So we go out and partner with Aspire for Her, who are helping us uh, train and, and create women that can be hired not just within AWS, but across uh, in the industry. And, and um, you know, we have, we have to have uh, an inclusive workplace. So we put focus on ensuring that as we hire, as we have more women we give them voices we make them um, you know bring their best selves they represent and then um, we also have a nurturing program um, to ensure that we bring women at the leadership level as well uh, and so I, as i speak uh, three years of of the work um, of course credit goes to our uh, many leaders across uh, but today um, my boss my manager uh, is vishali kasture who leads aws in india uh, our public sector leader is Shalini Kapoor, who leads the public sector business for AWS in India. Our pro-serve leader is Renu Menon, who leads the professional services business for AWS in India. And I'm part of a global business called AWS Industries, who I basically have a dotted line at a global level, and that's Catherine Renz that's leading uh, AWS Industries at a global level. So steps, some steps, but a lot more to go. So you're a quota hire, essentially, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks. And you know, the last time Madhura was telling me that uh, Chandra spoke somewhere, he said, I aspire for her. And that's just such a powerful I thing. I do. That's, you know, it's amazing. I, I, it's lovely to hear you say that. It talks about how assured and confident and uh, man you are. So great. congratulations on that. Sandeep, going to you, I think, um, I know IBM has been partnering with Aspire for her. And you know, Madhura has been really passionate about the work that she's, uh, she and her team have done for IBM. But just could you share with us, what does allying mean for IBM and for you? So allyship is, uh, or uh, allying is, I think, more than a concept at IBM. It's deeply rooted in our values. And it goes back to, I think, the genesis of uh, when the corporation started. So 1899 uh, was the first woman hire in IBM. Uh, that was, it goes way back, right? Uh, 1914, I believe, is uh, when we had the first hire, which was, uh, person with disabilities, you know, special abilities. And then we had an equal opportunity policy that we launched uh, in the 40s. So this is something that you know has been very much a deep-rooted uh, philosophy, if you will, and a value system within IBM, where um, the, the whole notion is we want people to sort of bring their full selves to work every day. And that's really, really important. That's point number one. Point number two, I think in I think Mike said it really well. There's a moral aspect to it, but there's an economic aspect. So in many respects, as we look at the world and the way the world's changing, I think having a complexion of workforce that mirrors what we see as uh, you know the customer base and client base, partner base and others, that becomes very, very important. So that's the, that's the um, uh, philosophy that we've been trying to uh, foster. So allyship in IBM, it's more about how do we empower, how do we support, and how do we coach um, in a way that makes the um, uh, f folks feel not only welcome, they feel supported, but more importantly, how do you sustain women in the workforce over a period of time. So there are several programs that we've been running. I think one that we've been doing with uh, uh, Aspire for Her is this notion of shine, lead, and search. And that's all about making sure that we are showcasing, we are creating recognition opportunities for you know women in the workforce, as well as making sure that they are getting the right opportunities for leadership. So that's point number one. Second. It goes down, it goes back to all leaders, whether they're men or women. But understanding what does inclusive leadership really mean? How do you really create opportunities? How do you take time to listen? Just listen and understand what are the dynamics that will actually sustain people in the workforce over a period of time. And then more importantly, how do you uh, create an environment where you actually provide training programs and improve your um, overall uh, talent pipeline, very similar to what, what Chandra was saying, right? In, in terms of making those opportunities available and creating the talent pipeline that will actually continue to build the workforce. Thank you. Chandra, if I could just uh, take on from where Sandeep said, which is that really, as, you, as both of you said, you know, the policies are there, your organizations are passionate about driving the change at the board level, there is, that desire to drive the change. How do you make sure that at the ground level these changes actually get implemented? That is, there's not just one Chandra in that office, but there are every every individual is a Chandra or you know aspiring to be a Chandra and support the women. What is it that you think that organizations should think differently about for these you know board board directives to actually get translated into reality? Because that's where I feel the penny drops every time, right? You just you just don't see it getting executed well enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I'll share what we have done at AWS. Um, so we created a program called um, uh, uh, Sponsor for Success. Uh, and, and, you know, multiple men leaders were given a one-on-one -on -one pairing with women top talent across the organization, right? So one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and, and I included, uh, we became like Sponsor for Success. And Sponsor for Success is not mentoring we actually became sponsors for them to be successful in what they see as success, right? So we dive deep in understanding what they really care about. How do they want to see themselves growing, right? And and help them, it was a one year long program uh, across APJ, 
we had um, you know uh, more than 200 men included as part of that program and 200 women who were budding up so it served as uh, as a two way uh, thing wherein um, women who were top talent who were you know aspirational and and we are helping them uh, grow to the next level and men also try and understand what they really care right what they really um, want to want to do in their career we we a lot of times we assume that you just want to get to the next level and, and that's not that's not the only way you can grow professionally you can go professionally by uh, learning new skills you can go grow professionally by making a larger impact by more visibility you know different people mean different so as we as we ran this program we uncovered a lot of those uh, insights and we would meet every quarter to understand how the program is running and at the end of the day we really appreciated we successfully celebrated the completion of that program but based on that based on the feedback coming from men and women we look to replicate and scale it at a worldwide level now oh that's great that's really good <laughs> sandeep uh, madhura was telling me a little bit about the b equal b equal right madhura it's called uh, the b equal batch at ibm and Really, that's really something that you're doing to do exactly what Chandra said, which is drive the change both ways, bottom up and top down. So, do you feel uh, you know measures like that actually are helping the whole cause of lead of you know making men actually own the whole cause of diversity and inclusion? Yeah, I think more than more than having them own it, I think the key thing is how do you create awareness and how do you encourage people to sort of be aware of what they should or shouldn't be doing. And, and then it obviously plays out in results. So for example, we are awarded as one of the top 10 companies in India for working women. And we are uh, also awarded as one of the most inclusive companies in India recently by Avtar Saramount. So I mean, things, things ultimately you know, uh, get recognized as well. But what I found the badge program to do is it serves as a very powerful catalyst in getting people um, aware in terms of what they need to do to listen, support, and engage very, very differently. Uh, one of the other things I'm extremely proud about, and we're not, we're not quite there yet, but uh, the IBM India board that I chair, we have, uh, I think with three out of the eight board members are women, and I want to get it to 50-50, hopefully soon. But uh, you have that's all the candidates here. Go, raise your hands. <laughs> so we do have that, and I, I think I think uh, you know as we make uh, and take these little steps, getting people um, to be aware of what are the uh, issues that actually prevent women uh, from moving up, getting into the right opportunities, and others. I think that's what the badge program and programs like that really do for us. Thanks, Sandeep. Um, I had one last question to both of you, which is that, you know, as you said, a lot of the organizations, a lot of the individuals are trying to drive change. But in my, what I feel is that when you see uh, some of these microaggressions happen at, at a working level, it really sets back the whole program, the whole cause, you know, and, and basically makes, makes it very difficult for women then to move ahead. Do you have strong policies on that? How are you, how are you ensuring? I, I know ev everywhere HR has this big policy on these issues, but how do you ensure that doesn't happen at a, at a working level? Uh, you want to go first? Okay. So, um, you know, uh, definitely that's something we, we absolutely need to ensure that it doesn't happen in the workplace. In, in a, in a, in a uh, great world, these kind of things don't happen. Uh, but then, um, you know, policies aside, I think that's where allies um, are important. When there is something um, happening in front of us to anyone, and that could be women and that could be anyone else, you need to raise your voice up, right? Uh, and and the person in the in the hot seat sometimes they may not be as aware, um, you know, that that they should be, you know, uh, saying no to this. But if you see that around, right, and it could be to anyone, and I think it's a, it's a responsibility on all of us to ensure that we are raising a voice when we see any kind of microaggression happening. And as an ally, as a man, um, I I I try to put a little additional thought uh, for the women uh, you know in the room um, you know even if you have one out of ten uh, people uh, one woman in the room um, you know we need to ensure that we are giving them the chance to speak to understand them because you know what 
they are not one in ten. They are still representing the fifty percent women that are out there in the world, right? So, if you are in any room, you you know you don't think you are the only person, uh, only woman out there, one or two or three. You are representing fifty percent of the population is the world. That's what last figure I know of, right? So you you need to you need to you need to raise your hand and and if there is any microaggression happening against you, raise your voice. That's great to hear, Sandeep. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll just. I mean, I'll just add to this. First of all, I want to make this more as a blanket statement. Microaggressions in any form against anyone should not be tolerated. I mean, we have a zero tolerance policy uh, against microaggression. So there are clearly HR policies in place. But one of the things that we have encouraged, and actually, it's um, uh, people people have taken advantage of it, is encouraging people to speak up. If there is even a perception of microaggression or any form of uh, derogatory statements and others, my um, counsel and I actually uh, voice this in every town hall, every quarter that I have with the entire population, you know, huge population we have, is speak up. And it's clearly, clearly for women, but it, it's for everyone in the organization, including other um, uh, communities and resource groups that may not be represented as, or may not feel represented as much. And that, I think, creating that um, environment and culture of openness and getting people to speak up, I think is, is excellent. And, and we take that very, very seriously. So if there is um, any, and, and we hear a lot of it, I mean, there's a lot of it that pops up, you know, on, on an ongoing basis. We have a zero tolerance policy against it. And I think we need to do that. I think we've got to walk the talk. Yeah. Walk, walk, walk the talk. I think that's really summed up our session. I have a lot more questions to ask you, but uh, Ruchita there is glow glowering at me saying my time is up. So thank you and a big round of applause for both of them. It takes I, a lot I to have, be an I have a quick question for you. So um, if you're taking a picture and you want people to smile, what do you say? Say cheese. Say cheese, right? <laughs> Uh, because she gives you that smile, right? Uh, she also gives the same oh, smile. So awesome. next time you take a picture, say she. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot to be people like Chandra and Sandeep. I see in the world of uh, men, you know, men need to show that they are aligned with more men. And the fact that these two have decided to completely walk the opposite talk really is credit to both of them. I know their organizations support them. But the fact that, you know, they give anecdotes like she and, you know, zero tolerance is just... Very, very inspiring. So big round of applause and thank you for your time. Both. Thank you so much. I'll, can I have Jaya Janardhanan come here, please? <laughs> thank you so much, Manisha, for leading that conversation. Yes, this is yours. Oh, nice. <laughs> this is for Chandra. Chandra. Thank you for being a big supporter of ours. Thank you. Thank you, Jaya. How interesting was that uh, conversation from policies to practicality, allies not just being a concept, uh, you know, sponsoring for success, from having women leaders as their bosses to creating a huge pipeline of women bosses. A uh, big round of applause to these two men who are leading this charge. Thank you so much, Sandeep and Chandra. In the company of empowered women leaders, uh, possibilities multiply, inspirations uh, flourish, Change becomes an inevitable force. We are in the august company of three such women who have turned challenges into opportunities and dreams into realities. They've turned conversations into actions that reverberate throughout generations. Please put your hands together as I call upon Shrika Sharma, Usha Thoret, and Dr. Ritu Adan. Please may have you on stage.
Shrika Sharma is the non-executive, non-independent director at Pyramil Enterprises Limited. As a former managing director and CEO at Axis Bank, she led the bank on a transformation journey from being primarily a corporate leader to a bank and with a strong retail deposit franchisee and a balanced lending book. Dr. Ritu Anand is an independent director. She holds a degree of Doctor of Philosophy from University of Mumbai and was Senior Vice President at DCS, where she has worked for three decades. Her expertise ranges from compensation and benefits, workforce policy planning, career development, performance management, welfare programs, including culture, coaching, counseling, and mentoring. She's one of the most recognized HR top voices, and she's known for her laughter as well. Usha. Usha Thorid, uh, uh, she's been, uh, you know, her career in, in RBI covers all areas of central banking and uh, regulation. Uh, I will, uh, she's handled uh, regulatory markets and core central banking uh, arenas. She's led India's voice in, in, in financial inclusion. She's the chairman of the MFAX of the SEBI. Uh, to lead this conversation, we of course have the cool Madhura Das Gutta Sinha. Over to you, Madhura. Actually, Madhura, this is looking like a wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Madhura, I will see you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is, uh, sorry, is this it's not working, right? No, it's working. It's, 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 it's working? No, it's not. No, no, no. You have to press. Turn it on. Oh, Thank you so much, Bhuvna. Indeed, a pleasure to be right here, back on this wonderful stage with some of my personal role models. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time for coming here. Now, you know, I promise to keep this very, very crisp because at the end of this, I want to ask them some rapid fire questions, which will help you to get to know them, not just as leaders, but as human beings. So. I'll get started, and in no particular order, perhaps, uh, Shikha, I will start with you. You know, I was finding it extremely difficult to call Shikha, Shikha. I asked her, should I, can I call you ma'am? She said, please call me Shikha. <laughs> Being the obedient person that I am, I decided to defer to her wishes. So thank you, Shikha. Uh, if I slip sometimes, please forgive me. So these are women who have actually defined role models for young women in our country, not so young women in our country as well. And uh, Shikha, first question to you is, um, you know, I have, this is the first time I'm talking to you like this. I have only seen you peeping out of uh, newspaper headlines. I have seen you on television. I have seen you on uh, magazines, in the top power lists everywhere. So it is indeed a privilege. So forgive me if I mix up all my questions and I confuse all the answers. <laughs> but it's a fangirl moment for me. Thank you once again for coming in. Um, you know, when we were growing up in banking, and um, it is such an honor for us to have all the luminaries of the banking space here on my left-hand side. Uh, when we were growing up in banking, we were seeing something very interesting, and we were seeing a whole host of women leaders actually emanate in banking. Uh, somehow that phenomenon or that sort of cohort of leaders rising, motivating other women who were looking up to them, uh, that phenomenon does not exist anymore. We can't see any cohorts arising like that. So I'd love to know your feeling about that. I mean, what has changed? Uh, is it an organizational element? Is it a cultural element or an ecosystem element? And uh, would you like to share some stories about your favorite women role models and women leaders? Uh, so that's a lot of questions out there. Uh, but uh, let me just talk to you about why so many women came out of the whole ICSA ecosystem yes. When, yes. when we did. When I joined ICSA, it was a development finance institution. It wasn't very large. And uh, I joined in the project finance department and there must be about 15 people. It was a time where India was growing. The financial sector was evolving. So there was a lot of opportunity over the next couple of decades at the point that I joined. Um, ICSA was a very safe environment. So um, 
it was just safe for women to be there. We were treated with respect. And safe sounds like a, you know, awkward word, but it, it just was very safe. You never felt threatened. You never felt discriminated. In fact, uh, Mr. Vagul, who you know quite well, encouraged equal opportunity. Yes. And he, you know, all of us were treated as equals. In fact, the joke used to be that uh, if you went to Kamath, he probably didn't even know whether he was talking to a man or a woman. It was that gender neutral <laughs> an organization. Um, and we had role models. Yes. So there were four things going. Uh, that joined an institution where there was a lot of opportunity for growth and learning. Uh, joined an institution where women found it safe and comfortable to work. Uh, we were actually treated as equals and given equal opportunity. And we had role models. Right. Because as... Uh, you know, women who are in the childbearing, rearing age, you all of us get into that guilt yes. uh, pangs of, am I sacrificing family when I'm going to work and doing a long uh, job? But uh, seeing people like Lalita Gupte, seeing yes. people, you know, Lalita Gupte was actually the biggest role model at that point of time because she was senior, she had had a couple of miscarriages, and after that she'd had two children and read the children and the children were lovely children. So you, you figured that, oh, it was possible to do that. And then when you kind of had doubts, you looked at her and said, if she can do it, I can do it too. But most importantly for me personally, uh, when I had my first child and I came back, um, I, I used to report to Mr. Vagul at that time. He gave me an exciting new role to do. Um, we had f got our first World Bank line of credit and uh, he asked me to lead that and say, set up the team for doing high-tech funding uh, for ICSI. So it was just such a challenging role that even if I found my son crying in the morning, I felt, oh, you know, I'm leaving something, but I have something to look forward to when I get to work. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much the same thing when I had my second child as well. We were then doing the joint venture with JP Morgan, and I was asked to be start up, part of that startup team. But because the team was small, as I said, and there were a lot of opportunities, a lot of women through that tough period were given exciting new challenges, which they found worthwhile to stay the course. Right. I think that has changed for a lot of organizations mm -hmm. now. Growth has slowed, um, and probably there aren't enough, you know, there was a talk of mentors and sponsors, and there probably aren't enough mentors and sponsors who are looking out for the women and making sure that they have an interesting, challenging role to come back to. Um, so a lot of women are actually falling off during that childbearing, childrearing uh, period. This is such an interesting uh, thought, and uh, you know, I, I didn't mention any names, and thank you for bringing out all those luminaries and leaders uh, in your conversation. And it, Amazing. And it's so amazing to say that the women actually felt, even at the end of the child rearing phase, to say that, hey, you know, I have such an important uh, challenging task at hand or such an important project to complete that it's worth uh, sort of being part of this. And uh, that's probably slowing down yeah, in some Madhura, ways. You know, so that insight came to me when I moved to Access Bank as well. Right. And there were a couple of very bright girls who were who had babies and they were ready to sit at home. Right. And since I knew them, I kind of spotted them and gave them some, some strategy roles and right. some new projects to do. Right. And they stayed the course. And it's a, it's a two year period. If yes. you handhold them and yes. you give them something interesting to do during that two year period, yes. then you're past the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely, I can interrupt you. Absolutely, okay. absolutely ma'am. Uh, yeah. So, I asked uh, Mr. Kamath the same question, you know, when I was interviewing him for something. Apart from what he said about giving challenging, I think the thing he mentioned to me as to, I asked him the same question, how come so many leaders? So he said that uh, at that critical stage when they were child rearing, there was a lot of flexibility also. Correct. The kind of, in, the, in terms of working hours, in terms of leave, in terms of all kinds of adjustment as long as, and I think that way they retained the women's loyalty. And the attrition was very, very low. So it was another real investment, you know, from a long-term perspective, from the, in the interest of the company. Amazing. You're absolutely right, Usha. Amazing. So culture, challenge, and champion, the three Cs, I think, which played the uh, role, and the, cha the champion, of course, Mr. Kamath being at the front and center. And of the role this. models. And the role models. I mean, of course, Alita Gupte is uh, another. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kalpana, uh, of course, of course, fantastic. Thank you. So um, I will now 
move to Usha ma'am and uh, Usha. <laughs> you know, this is becoming more and more yeah. difficult. <laughs> okay. So, you know, to me, because I've been a banker for 25 years, you know, there is God and there is RBI. <laughs> and I said the same thing to Shamla ma'am. <laughs> And it's very difficult, ma'am. Please don't make me call you Usha. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, you know, a question to you in terms of your own journey, because in RBI, you've actually seen some of the most tumultuous, some of the most difficult years for the country, for the economy. Um, tell us a favorite story of a woman in a boardroom or somebody who truly made a difference. Uh, we've always had women, actually, before, I mean, before Shamla and I became deputy governors, we've had uh, another deputy governor, Mrs. Udeshi, who was there. Yes, of course. And we've also had executive directors who were there around the same, I mean, they were there before us. So I think many of the points have already been made. This whole uh, talk about mentoring, I think the men in the Reserve Bank, when we were really, you know, getting into the high to our career actually pushed us right. and I was talking to Shamla the other day and said after both of us nobody has become deputy governor why is that somebody yeah. asked me this question a yeah. couple of days ago yeah. yeah and I said is it because we didn't mentor enough or is it that the leadership is not picking them up and pushing them and I said Shamla you and I would not have become deputy governors but for <laughs> Dr. Reddy and she totally agreed with me because there is, okay, you may be very competent, you may be very good, but still I think there is a need for that push. So I think this whole, this whole business of, I don't think mentoring is exactly what I have, in, I'm saying it's also pushing, pushing right. for you. Right. Because it is a government appointment ultimately. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But so the, I mean, whenever you were asking me this question of, is there anything I recollect? I mean, my biggest memory of the crisis, I don't know whether it's got any relationship to women in boardroom because at that time we never felt any, uh, you know, it was really a very uh, equal, uh, it's just like what she said about Mr. Kamath, she didn't know whether you're talking to a man or woman. So it was like our uh, governors and deputy governors were like that, they were so very open to what you were saying and your, uh, you know, what your competence rather than your uh, agenda. So I, the story I remember is really uh, having Shamla with me. I mean, that for me was a really an important thing because uh, during the crisis, uh, there was a totally new governor. Shamla had gone to her daughter for her daughter's delivery. And the other, uh, I mean, the other deputy governor had actually, I mean, he was very good, but he was going to be leaving very soon. Um, and two of them, in fact. So we literally had to hold the fort. And every day was a crisis day. Every day there was something new that was happening. And here, uh, she was sitting in US. So we were actually looking at different proposals on a daily basis and she would turn it around at night. And when I came to my mailbox in the morning, Shamla's reply was there and I would shoot out something to her. And, she, and we did this day after day after day, just 24 hours. <laughs> And he was trying to retrieve those mails just for history and record. I mean, it was incredible. I think just the comfort, you know, was of an unbelievable order. I think that really, for me, is a wonderful story from the crisis. Amazing. Amazing. And thank you for sharing this. I don't think there was any other uh, forum where, uh, you know, this kind of a story can be shared as this personal story and the fact that all of these uh, the governors, uh, the deputy governors who we have just heard about and we read about and they're all coming to life through this and uh, RBI never sleeps, uh, you know, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's because she was in US. <laughs> <laughs> no, we always believe that as bankers, uh, ma'am. <laughs> uh, I will now move to the other side and, you know, uh, you know, in our entire Aspire for Her journey, I must tell you that we have had two major pillars of success and two major sectors which have actually always cheered us on. One is finance and the other is technology. And Dr. Ritu Anand is, of course, a very, very famous name. Everybody knows you. You're a LinkedIn influencer. You're a celebrity. But tell us about this laughter thing. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I had to start with that. <laughs> I was uh, interviewed by Mr. Kohli and that has been my highlight for like life. Uh, we just recently lost him last year, you know, and all of you know Mr. Kohli. So, you know, at, when you entered his cabin, I didn't know who he was. And uh, when he finished the interview, he said, we are experimenting with you. Because I was a PhD and not an MBA, HR. So, then when it, everything was done, so I said, can I ask a question? May I ask a question? So, I mean, audacity, I just remember now. So, it had nothing to do with being a woman or a man. But, uh, and I asked whatever I had to ask and uh, from then on there was, uh, he was observing me obviously and I was very audacious with, I'm talking about 90s, early 90s <coughs> and I went with the proposal that we must have a daycare or crash type of a thing in 1990s and uh, Mr. Kohli was livid and uh, like he was famous for whatever, I just adore him and almost like something like throwing the paper away and he said, uh, uh, you don't know where you are working and blah, 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 blah. And then he told my boss that she will never uh, reach the top. <laughs> and, uh, and that is because I was not afraid to express or I was always, uh, uh, you know, if I was angry, it will show and if I was happy, it will show. I didn't learn my lesson, so the laughter and expression and uh, fun continued and uh, here I am and if I am an influencer, it is because of the love that some people down below gave it to me. But uh, so that, that is my story about laughter and Bhumna, I'll hate you for this, but I, <laughs> but uh, when uh, all of you write that uh, the fun in corporate was missing or is missing, I cherish that. Doesn't matter if I wasn't a CEO or a CXO or whatever in HR, but I'm happy. So Amazing. I will also talk about, um, since time is running out, I'll talk about few incidents and you can define it as a conscious bias or an unconscious bias. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there is, a, uh, every company has a policy that uh, we are an equal opportunity employer. Okay, all right, so we are equal opportunity employer, but look at the numbers. 100 men walking into the boardroom, 100 leadership when the customer comes in are black and brown suits with probably some shades of grey somewhere. So we are equal opportunity employers. The world has 50%, India has 50%, we are equal opportunity employers. So that story does not ring a bell unless you see it in numbers. So very famously, uh, 2007, this consciousness came into my mind that if everything is so equal, then why the numbers are looking so bad? And that is where the reality of data came in. And of course, coming down to the biases, I'm sitting, uh, whether I was a woman or a man, both of you ladies said exactly the right thing. Our bosses never thought we were a man or a woman, we were just people, come in. So at 9 o'clock we are having a meeting, we are continuing to sit. So uh, I and my boss are, whoever my boss was, please, well, we are sitting and uh, the an another very high profile guy, uh, leader walks in and he's saying, hey, so and so, let's go out for a drink to Bombay Gymkhana, we were in TCS house and this is 2015, it is not like 1990s. So he didn't even look at me, but I was like Mr. India. <laughs> so, and my boss packed the bags and both of them walked away. <laughs> so I'm born, maybe some of you by now know I'm born in Amritsar, educated till post-graduation. I was in uh, Amritsar, got married and came here, did my PhD, PhD here. So that small town, that hesitation to speak up was there. But I, I, today I could have... Don't believe that, but it's No, okay. but today, today the same thing happened. I would say, excuse me. But at that time, I didn't have the guts to say, I just packed my laptop and I went away. But this incident has not left my... And those guys are senior people, they have gone places and they are lovely people, they gave me all the opportunities. But this is conscious or this is unconscious, I don't know. I refuse to call it 
सॉरी लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई रिफ्यूज टू कॉल इट अनकॉन्शियस बायस इट्स इट इज़ नॉट अनकॉन्शियस बाय नाउ इन 2023 इट इज कॉन्शियस बायस बिकॉज एंड द ओनली सोल्यूशन आई हैव लॉट ऑफ बिकॉज आई बिन प्रैक्टिशनर इन दिस स्पेस मैम उषा एंड शिखा जी सो आई वुड गिव यू अ सोल्यूशन दैट अनलेस यू आर बाय डिजाइन गोइंग आफ्टर सच माइक्रो बिहेवियर्स nothing will change you will have board 10.0 and still you will have 90 men and 10 women thank you thank you very much ritu for that i will now move to rbi once again <laughs> rbi never sleeps but you know one question that i want to ask you is around this whole regulatory piece around having women on boards right i mean the regulator has said that we must have an one independent director etc we still have uh, only we have 18% uh, women on boards right now uh, but the leadership uh, pipeline is only 5% there are only five so we know that there is an inorganic element in the whole uh, women on boards piece well do you really feel that the regulator can do something with this kind of regulation to change real mindsets and to make real change and if yes what <clears throat> yeah i think uh, it's true that when you look at the numbers of uh, women independent directors and women the data that you provided was very helpful it has increased and it has actually increased at the behest of the regulator so now is that a good thing is that a bad thing should i think in a overall i think it's a good thing because it's when boards are required to look for women for regulators they're not going to compromise on the competence aspect so they are going to get uh, good people it's just that they look for good people so at least that bias is taken away by the regulation but having got that there i was thinking of the other question which is really women in executive yes directors position and if you look at that it's very very small and even more so when you look at ceos yes so uh, so there we have to really address the problem and a lot of it lot of it has been talked about today i think is essentially a mindset issue right so uh, and there's some way we always seem to convey that women are different from men but i think there are women qualities and there are men qualities now there are certain qualities which we need both are needed and women are usually considered to be risk averse they are considered to be more cautious more careful more uh, uh, altruistic more nurturing that's the kind of women qualities the men qualities are more adventurous more uh, risk taking more uh, daring more yes. willing to disrupt existing things so <clears throat> therefore it leads to people to think that you know there's some very popular thing that used to go around if leman brothers had been leman sisters would the crisis have happened <laughs> and later there was a times uh, cover which had the picture of uh, elizabeth warren and mary shapiro and um, the other uh, lady i forget her name which said that these are the women who you know sort of mopped up the mess who sort of cleaned up the mess so that means women if women had been there at the top things would not have happened and i really don't agree with that i <laughs> just, just i have a question story. which keeps coming to my mind i uh, men never needed any training their competence was never a question why women training was needed i could never understand Uh, but did i say women training was needed <laughs> no but it is happening women on boards i think that, no no i think the answer to that i want to go back to that and that's again a question of the mindset it's a very interesting story again a father and a son are they have a car accident the father dies instantly the boy is taken to the hospital to the operating table he has to be operated and there the surgeon looks at him and says no i can't he is my son and this was in a in a in a state in usa where same sex marriage was quite legal so the person who was trying to tell the story was saying that this is not that question so what was the obvious answer the surgeon was a mother no women immediately think about it but nobody thought about it right. the mindset you know that is i think something that we have to deal with and i think that's the same story here as well when you think about it no women are for staff functions men are for line functions 
men are from mars men are from venus you know this kind of a, and that's why i was really not so thrilled with your wow <laughs> why should we focus on the looks and why should we look focus on the color we have to focus on the fact that men can look equally terrific and what we want is that mindset which does not really discriminate you know it's that is the point i would like to make and i think there the it's not sebi or any regulator who can do anything about it it's the banks boards themselves and the top leadership managerial leadership in companies who have to do it and the women themselves how many women women have put a break on themselves and not have said no i have to balance my family and my professional career and therefore i don't want to aspire for this job now we have to see how they can be empowered right so this is another thing which shikha said which is very good <clears throat> is that the women on board actually create a huge influence on other women you know in the in the workforce because when they see that oh this person can do it then why can't i do it so i think both the things the self aspiration as also the and of course like somebody told me there is a women in board bring a lot of discipline in the board now i don't know whether you agree it's because women are on the board but just he says no no otherwise it becomes like a men's club it's good that women are there <laughs> thank you so much thank you and it is this mindset that we try to attack every day at aspire for her we have actually a mindset change model as you know which we have stolen from a much more famous model and with that i'll just move to uh, shikha for the next question and this is really the we just going to ask two questions around so we're not going to take too much time but just last question for you and then it's only rapid fire so uh, this question for you is your transition from an executive to a non executive role uh and you know many women here will be interested to hear that because a lot of them are moving uh, or want to aspire to be independent director positions uh, how do you see that transition and how what's the difference between the two so yeah it takes a bit of time to make that transition because when you're in an executive role uh you focus on problem solving you jump into problem solving very quickly and uh you want to see impact and you want to go and make a difference whereas in a non executive role i think one has to remember it's about advice it's about governance but it's not about doing you're not supposed to provide the answers you're not expected to provide the answers if somebody asks you a question you can advise i think our job is really to uh, to make sure that the company has the right strategy it has the right leadership talent it has the right processes in today's world with you know so much of risk coming from geopolitical cyber etc that we have the right risk management policies so it's a lot more about governance frameworks and advice and uh, credibility of uh, all the accounts rather than actual problem solving and that's a mindset shift for somebody who's done an executive role for a long time i have to admit it took me a while to get there um but but it's an interesting new phase of life fantastic thank you and the word mindset keeps coming back and with that i move to ritu anand and uh, i will start the rapid fire piece now and i will first start with uh, i'm not going to give people too much time to think so it's going to be really really fast uh, what's your favorite relaxation mode seeing television i'm <laughs> um, over to you favorite relaxation mode playing with my grandson wow <laughs> favorite like gardening fantastic and some painting recently and some painting paint I mean. oh my god so we have painting and spending time with the grandchildren and uh, fantastic uh, seeing television so favorite food methi alu <laughs> khichdi <laughs> Now you know what you can serve them if you call them for dinner, and very very simple stuff. And uh, so this is what our leaders like: very simple stuff, and the simplicity is coming through. Thank you. Uh, favorite holiday destination? Amritsar. Oh, <laughs> that's my hometown. I've got my brother sister living there, so being with people is my passion, and I, that's what I love. Fantastic. Uh, Ladakh at the Tiger Parks. Oh ah. my God! <laughs> What about you, ma'am? No particular favorite, but anything with history and nature. Wow! 
Amazing. So history, nature, and food in Amritsar. <laughs> and tiger. Family in Amritsar. <laughs> Family in Amritsar. I, I was thinking food when you said Amritsar. <laughs> I too thought of food. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Last question to all of you. One word of advice that you will have for this room full of people who are looking up to you. First to Usha ma'am. Same thing what I said. <clears throat> Just push for yourself. Three words, push for yourself. Shika. Usha, you said what I would have said, but uh, I think if I had to add something else, it would be, yeah, just be positive, believe in yourself, and be honest at all times. Thank you. Positivity, honesty, belief. You have to make a choice. You have a choice to make that particular choice. Don't blame anyone other than yourself for the choices you make. And once you make, stick by it. I made a lot of difficult choices. Some of them succeeded, some of them failed. But if you have to keep that smile positivity, then the only way is that you are your own boss. All external stimuli will come, take it, but bounce it out. You decide what is your core and get known for that core. Fantastic. Throw that ladder. Throw that ladder. Absolutely. That was such else. an amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's an amazing line to finish this with. And while Elizabeth is not here, we shall replay this back to her. Uh, I think let's all say that together, if you like, for the Namrata, can you take that? Throw that ladder. Yeah. We'll all say it together. Throw that, that ladder. ladder. For somebody to climb in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madhura. Thank you to my lovely panel. Couldn't have asked for a more inspiring panel. Thank you so much for giving us this time, this Saturday afternoon. And we will request Divya Sampath to come forward. Please Where don't go without you your entrepreneurial hampers. Yes, ma'am, please. Where else can you find so much inspiration in one room? And uh, for me as a marketing person to hear so much about finance is really a, you know, a great thing. Just thank you, Divya. Yes, no, there's a name. Yes, yes, Ah, yes, I did check. Thank you so much for being with us. After that uh, great panel, a gathering of women isn't complete, and men, sorry, <laughs> isn't complete without a dash of laughter, a sprinkle of joy, and a whole lot of fun, because celebrating life is an essential part of our journey. We have three women from Fertidus who are here to create entertainment with a difference. The audience on the floor are all yours, Tanuja, Shiny, and Ranjana, all yours. <laughs> We have 15 minutes. Check. Awesome. Uh, I must begin by saying it has been such a pleasure to sit here and listen to these guys, right? So I think a huge round of applause for everyone who's spoken here today. Uh, well, uh, I'm Shiny Bangera and we are, and that's my colleague Ranjana and we are from Fatado School of Music. Um, yes, how many musicians in the house? Very quickly. Listen. Listen. One second. 
Yeah, listening doesn't qualify as a musician. <laughs> How kind, how kind of you, ma'am. <laughs> well, uh, check, check. Hello, check. check. Hello, check. We are here Hello, to check. bring out a little music, you know, in you, if I may say so. So I'm going to quickly request uh, these to be passed around on each table. Yeah, we've made sets and you can just go put them at the center of the table. We're going to put out percussion instruments. We want you to grab one. If you're taking the sticks, make sure you're taking a pair. If you're taking the triangle, make sure to take the steel stick along with it. The shakers, individual, and the tambourine. Quickly grab the instruments. Okay, take one, one each. If you, if you haven't got yours, you can reach out to us. We will very quickly give it to you. Oh, excuse me. Okay, looks like everybody is like escaping from the next few minutes. Yes. All right. So, thank you everyone who's excited to bring the music out. Right? You've got your instruments. People having tea can also grab their instruments. Okay, and people in, in the one back. Hand. Thank you. How about the lovely ladies here? You just need to grab an instrument. Please. Okay, so now instruction time. All right, everyone. Sir, can I have a, a whistle, please? Thank you. All right, so instruction time. Very simple. We're going to teach you to play what instrument you're holding. Just a kind reminder, please do not click photographs. We, uh, there have been instances, please do not click photographs. Thank you. Awesome. So we're going to show you how to play the instrument. Grab one of them. Sure. Just follow the lead. Very easy, very simple. Don't look scared. A couple of you are looking really tense, like, oh God, <laughs> will I be able to do this? Trust me. Very easy. Over to Ranjana for the instructions. Can we have this on? Stand mic. Hello, check. All right. Uh, quickly to name the instrument, these are called shakers. Now they look like eggs, so they are called egg shakers. Okay. Now I'm going to just any instrument y'all have it, whether this shakers or the stick. All you got to do is, whenever I say listen, I want you all to listen. Okay? When I say clap or play, you all are supposed to play. Clear with the roots? Okay? Listen. One more time. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Ready, steady, ready, play. And stop. Okay, now the one who is playing this instrument can also use this side if it is hurting too much because I could all hear is something like this. Okay, let's try one more time. And the shakers people, something like this. Ready, steady, ready, listen, 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 <laughs> listen. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Ready, steady, ready, play. Much better. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Check. Check. And stop. The idea is to play together. It's not a race. <laughs> Remember. <laughs> Alright? No one has to run ahead. We've got to play it together. Alright, now we know the rhythm part, okay? Now we're going to keep on playing this on my command. And I'm just going to add some little layer of music. Uh, you all can also join along because we will do it in group. Mein so no problem, okay? Ready for it? Okay, on my command. Ready, steady. Ready, steady, ready, start. One, two, three, four. Mm. 
So that's how the music and the rhythm works. Sur and Tal works. We just saw a quick glimpse of all that. I hope you all had super duper fun. Ye sirf starter stuff. Picture abhi baaki hai. Okay, let's move on to our next set. <laughs> okay, so now that we've established that all of us can sing and sing well, we're going to make you all sing. A little group. more. In a group. Yeah, little more. <laughs> No, we will sing individual. I think you all were all very, very amazing. In, I mean, sounding amazing. So, <laughs> we are going to play this activity called Dhun Pehchan. We will go to the slide. I will tell you next, 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 next. No, no. Oh, huh. All the way down, 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 down. Yes. Alright. Okay. So, what I am going to do is just quickly divide the room into two parts. Okay. Yeah. So from this, left? yeah, from this side, I'm gonna choose. I like this gentleman because he's just smiling so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sir, I want you to pick anything that's on the screen, color or Some numbers, characters. symbols, logos, whatever, anything. Which one? Mickey, you want Mickey Mouse. Mouse. Okay, let's so basically hear. We'll play the audio. All you have to do is guess the tune and sing along with it. We all can join in. Let's hear what So that's, that's for this side of the room. Okay, ah. you ready to listen? Okay, Mickey Mouse is saying I'm not going to play the audio right now. Oops. Okay, we can we choose another one? Why is it? Uh -huh, one minute. I think you're not playing it from the drive. Sir, PPT is Okay. So I think, sir, do you like the blue color? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for liking blue color. <laughs> I have the audio in blue, so <laughs> let's go for blue. <laughs> Anyone knows the song? I like the way they are continuing the percussion activity. You want to sing it? For your team. Round and uh, very kind, sir. You've clearly grabbed attention. Amazing whistle. Yeah. So, <laughs> coming to you, I think uh, I will give you the option of choosing any color at the moment. Uh, uh, 
Harvard close to this pink. Pink. Okay. Pink food, Let's huh? go with pink. <laughs> I know everybody know knows the song, but everybody's just humming. Along. Forgot the lyrics, but right? We know the, the song. Line. Tujhe kitna chahenge hum? We sang awesome. Round right of yes. applause, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. On this side. Okay, someone who like enjoying the. <laughs> wow, wow, she's there. Yes. <laughs> okay, she's raised her hand, so I'm gonna go to you. Yes. Yellow. The one next to the grey. One next to the grey. Okay. वो वाला नहीं. ये वाला. Grey के बाजू वाला. Yes. lovely okay one picture ranjana very quickly come for a picture yes the down one is also working the down one is also working so we found out that the numbers are also working you can click 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 <laughs> we are good <laughs> so okay. the numbers are also working so this side who would like to give it a try i think we sat on the same table so i'm going to come right at the back <laughs> yes <laughs> one moment so either the colors or the numbers the last row the last two works but not mr bean uh, mr bean also okay. we can take it a try check if it is there uh -huh. yes mr bean also okay so mr bean let's hear what's behind mr bean oh we all know this love okay now it's time for this side who are uh, who ma why don't you choose i was just you know coming there red red the color red We want to mix it up a little bit more. It's a okay? laughter as well. Yeah. So our next round is called the goal mal round. Okay. What we've done is we've done a little goal mal. We are showing you something. We are making you hear something else. Okay. So I think now I have to talk like this because I know. <laughs> most of them have moved to this side of the room. So <laughs> very quickly, we will take you to the next round. And if you know the answer, just put your hand up and say I do. We will come to you. Okay, and this is open to everybody, not based on which side of the room you belong. Okay, ready? 
all you have to do is guess what you see, not what you hear. We repeat. Yes. The first one. Yes. What song is this? Anyone? That's why it's called Gopal. Anybody knows the original song? राम चंद्र कह गए सिया से नहीं नहीं ये वो वाला नहीं है आई हैव अ स्पेशल गिफ्ट आल्सो फॉर दिस हां शायद यस वी डू हैव गिफ्ट्स वी डू हैव गिफ्ट्स टू गिव अवे सो वेरी क्विकली या आई एग्री इट वाज बिफोर यू वर बोर्न नॉट डिनाइंग दैट एट ऑल एनीबॉडी एनीबॉडी इन द हाउस Give us a hint. It's old. Hmm. Okay. Why don't we do? Uh, we have. Nah. <laughs> Not that one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, it's almost there. Wow! Wow! wow. <laughs> High five. <laughs> so we've got, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. If you could please come here, we've got a special gift for you. And if I may call the author. to please give away the prize <laughs> i think we all should clap with our respective instruments you know whoever is still <laughs> <laughs> okay the next one let's see the next one sir nain lad gayi ve to manwa ma nain lad gayi ve next gori ke sath okay next 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 Oh let's see if you can get this one Main to gaadi se ja raha tha Main to kehti ban ja raha tha Main to topi pehna raha tha We are all smiling listening to this song I can hear we know this song but we don't know what song is this That's the game. Anybody 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 Okay who can tell me who's the artist Bruno Mars okay Let's see Shit, I didn't see that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay, song. Any Bruno Mars song that you remember? Yes, 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 yes. Almost there. Almost there. I know it's Motown something. Okay, so it's. No, I'll I'll still give it to you. So it's Uptown, Uptown Funk. Funk. <laughs> The town was there, so that's good enough. Please come and collect your prize. So sorry, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's okay we we <laughs> Superb thank you so much lovely next one we we'll love the next one You can continue having your snack everybody who's sitting here please grab your chai nashta and you can come and continue something like that right <laughs> a a a dola re dola re dola re dola mandola dil dola mandola re dola dola re dola re dola re dola mandola dil dola dil dola re dola bandh ke main payal pehen ke main kangna are jhoom ke na something 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 all the lyrics are all over the place <laughs> Awesome please come please come <laughs> please come and collect your prize for uh, i think a uh, huge round of applause for making your own song <laughs> along the way writing your own lyrics on the spot okay so the audience is still enjoying the round looks like even as they're enjoying the snack so we'll go for another one ha yeah Anyone? Even one word is 
Arjuna from the song. It's a very famous song. Yes, I don't know the song, but I know the. Do the you know the movie? The? Do you know the movie? Padmavat. That's Padmavat. Okay, so yes, two winners. Please come. Two winners. It's Kali Bali. <laughs> Kali Bali, ho gaya hai dil. That's the song. <laughs> Yes, yes, bilkul. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Superb, yeah. Last one. One last one. one. He's from the <laughs> consulate. Exactly. Kali bali, kali bali. Tohar, vidjat papad ho har baar kar ram to ram, to ram to ram. Kya baat hai? Aapko bhi waise bhi gift dene wali thi. हमारे दिल में अजब ये उलझन है गाने बैठे गाना सामने समधन है हाउ स्वीट मैम कम प्लीज कम कलेक्ट योर प्राइज